The following program is a presentation of the Wapaka Historical Society. Thank you so much for having such fantastic weather. My first time in Wapaka. This is like gorgeous. Absolutely, I just love it. Got here a little in town a little bit early and I brought a picnic lunch and I sat. There's got to be a quick trip somewhere. Sure enough, there's a quick trip and I could get, you know, get a refueled there. But they have little nice picnic tables out there and I was able to enjoy a nice dinner before I came here. But I'm looking forward to some cookies afterward too. So anyway, thanks so much, Tracy, for the friendly introduction. I'm going to be talking to you about the Amish this evening. Who are the Amish? And um, I give a pr presentations related to the Amish and traditional Mennonites quite frequently. But the, the wonderful thing about going to, to presenting to different groups is that the questions and answers, there, the discussion that come up afterward are always different. So I think I can anticipate a lot of the sort of major questions that people have, but there's no way that I'll be able to anticipate all of them. So I'm going to make sure that we have plenty of time at the end to be able to a answer any questions that you might have. So a lot of what I'm going to be doing this evening is kind of dispelling a lot of misconceptions about the Amish, because the Amish are extremely well known. They're very, very visible in areas where they live, like for example in Wisconsin, which has a fairly large Amish population. I'll be talking about details in a moment. But even in places all around the world, you know, people think about the Amish, or they mispronounce it as Amish in a lot of places. But as familiar as the Amish are as a part of North American society, the United States and Canada, there's a lot of misunderstandings, a lot of stereotypes, a lot of, um, in some cases, suspicion, questions that people have, but a lot of, uh, you know, kind of information that's maybe not exactly on the right track. So what I hope I'm going to be able to do for you this evening is to clarify a lot of these misunderstandings. Um, I'm going to be starting off with some, the, the basic image of the Amish, and essentially the Amish's root, the roots of the Amish in North America go back really to the early colonial era. So they've been here for over 300 years. It's a very, very long standing presence. So their roots in the United States are deep. They're much deeper in the United States and Canada now, or North America broadly, than they were in Europe, which is where they come from. The vast majority of the Amish ancestors came from Switzerland. Although they did not migrate directly from Switzerland to North America, they migrated into other parts of, we could say, Germanic um, Central Europe places like Eastern France, which was originally or his, uh, the, the heritage is a very strong German one, parts of what's today Germany, some actually migrated into Eastern Europe and even Russia, right, um, which is sort of less well known. But the vast majority, for reasons that we'll be discussing in, uh, in the, the presentation this evening, decided that Europe was not going to be the place where they'd be able to main, their, that's where their roots were, but that's not where they would be able to live and practice their religion freely. And so they were drawn, like lots and lots of people seeking religious and economic and political freedom, to come to the American colonies and then eventually settle in the United States um, and Canada. So, but the vast majority live in the United States. Now, it was after, there were only about 500 that came during the colonial era. It's a very, very small number. Contrast that today with the fact that they are the fastest growing group of human beings on the entire planet. The Amish have about, you know, approaching 380,000 people, starting with about 500 maximum in the colonial era, but they have between triple and quadruple the U.S. average of number of kids, right? So they have on average around six and seven, and most of those kids and their moms survive, right? So infant mortality, maternal mortality are quite low, right? Because they're having, you know, kids in, a, in, a, in, a, in societies, the United States and Canada, where essentially maternal and infant mortality are quite low because of the healthcare infrastructure. And also for aspects of their lifestyle that I'll be talking about uh, later in my presentation. But it's not just enough to have a lot of kids and to have those kids survive. Those kids have to make the decision to formally join the Amish church as young adults. Um, which they do to, uh, to the tune of about 90%. So about 90% of kids who are born to Amish parents make the decision as young adults, basically late teens, just approaching 20, to formally join the Old Order Amish Church. Now that's basically the secret for rapid growth, right? You have lots of kids and you have, essentially you, you offer them a choice, right, between being Amish and not Amish, 
that is increasingly attractive, which is, again, one of those things that's in terms of like misunderstandings and stereotypes, it's something that surprises a lot of outsiders. A lot of people think it's like, why would somebody want to say forego electricity or not own or operate your own automobile? Hope by the end of my presentation this evening, you'll realize why being Amish is so attractive um, to young people who make this choice. It was after the Civil War that uh, the rest of America started paying attention to the Amish. And until really the middle of the 20th century, the vast majority only lived in basically the, the mid-Atlantic states. So like Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Indiana. Not many in Canada, and those who lived in Canada where they still are concentrated today is Ontario, Southern Ontario, so not that far from say like upstate New York and Niagara Falls. Um, they have now spread to 32 US states and four Canadian provinces. So most American states have an Amish presence now. But their numbers were quite small. It was after the Civil War um, when journalists and travel writers started to take note of these so-called queer people living out in the wilds of Pennsylvania and Ohio. So we see, for example, this headline from 1884, a curious people in Ohio. They bang their hair and wear Mother Hubbards. Right? Do you know what a Mother Hubbard is, by any chance? No, no, actually it's not the bonnet. I thought that too when I first read that. Mother Hubbard is basically like a house coat, right? My grandmother used to call it a house coat. So it's not a robe exactly, it's basically a house coat. So bang their hair, referring to how the men have the sort of Dutch haircut, right? They bang their hair and wear Mother Hubbards. So basically what sort of stands out? Their physical appearance, right? Their dress, how they look. 1901, they refused to make oath, right? To refuse to swear oaths. We'll talk about that in a moment. Amish people giving trouble to tax assessors. So we've gone from being curious or a little bit odd, different, to being maybe just a little bit problematic, right? right? This is not sort of positive attention here. 1908, keep most of the old ways. Yet the Amish people so sh show some changes toward the customs about them, have scattered wildly. Buggies are becoming common among them. This was in a time when people were, buggies were like the automobiles around the turn of the century, right? Buggies were considered fancy. Wagons were sort of, you know, kind of more old fashioned and holding back. Carpets are coming even into use, even buttons are seen. Now again, this really doesn't get, any of those headlines doesn't get at all to who Amish people really are, which is a mem members of a Christian group, a subgroup, nothing about the religion at all. We kind of move into the 20th century here, and there's a lot of emphasis on how they're not keeping up with the rest of society as far as technology goes. And especially in the 1950s, this was something where people were thinking, it's like, are they crazy, right? That's like, that's, you know, the, the greatest thing about mainstream society it, are all the appliances, all the things that you could, that, that all the benefits that you can reap from technology. Here, from 1960, and this is actually taken from Wisconsin, a Wisconsin newspaper, members of an unusual religious sect. Here we go, there's a re reference to religion, but it's an unusual sect. And sect for a lot of people is really almost synonymous with cult, right? So it's not something, you know, again, it's sort of a negative impression here. Refuse to bow to a changing world. And that's sort of like stubbornness, right? And sort of like, you know, uh, keeping themselves and their young people intentionally ignorant. That's a common misunderstanding. Now let's turn the clock ahead to the 21st century and we see more color images here. <laughs> it's not getting a whole lot clearer <laughs> or more objective. These are taken from so-called reality TV shows that are on cable TV. Thank goodness these two shows are no longer on anymore. But basically, anybody that watches reality TV shows realize that there's, it's TV, not a whole lot of reality in it, right? And one program that was particularly uh, way off the mark, none of these people are Amish, incidentally. Some of them grew up in Amish families, but none of these people, these actors, paid actors, are actually Amish themselves. One thing that's a little bit problematic about Amish mafia is that the Amish Mennonite church, I'm a Mennonite myself, our churches are all what are known as historic peace churches, so like the Quakers, which means that not only do we not serve in a, in a violent capacity in the military, we also are so-called non-resistant people, which means that we do not meet violence with violence, either physical violence or say emotional violence or verbal violence or anything like that. And the premise of this show is that there's basically this kind of like Amish youth vigilante posse group called the Amish Mafia that's out there to protect their community with things like sawed off shotguns. So it's like completely off the mark and in fact offensive, right, when you, when you consider it. 
Now, even more recently, and I believe this is still on there, the focus has now shifted to abuse, right? There's a kind of focus or the fascination with sex, sex sexuality, and crimes, right? Uh, in American society generally, and if there are stories of, say, abuse or uh, crimes that are somehow committed by Amish people, which are extremely rare, then that's something that makes page one of the newspapers, right? In the same way, I mean, you watch the evening news and there's not a lot of feel good, you know, warm puppy stories kinds of things. A lot of it is about crime and things that, are, that have to do with deviant behavior. So this is one thing that is uh, a particularly, um, you know, big revenue generator for Peacock, which is affiliated with NBC. Now, a lot of times I go to public libraries and I think this is historically a public library here, right? Good vibes in here, I like it. <laughs> um, it's interesting when I do presentations at public libraries and I talk to librarians and they say, you know, there's a lot of interest among our patrons among the Amish. I say, oh, really? And they say, yeah, these books just fly off the shelves, <laughs> right? This is no, have you ever heard the term for Harlequin romances? <laughs> bodice rippers, bodice ripper, you heard about the term? They jokingly refer to these books as bonnet rippers. <laughs> um, basically, they are, it's Christian literature and so there's really not much in the way of sex, right? Um, but they are romance novels, right? And they're extremely popular, right? Every year there are literally dozens of new titles coming out from multiple authors. I like, you know, sometimes people ask me, is like, is there anything that I would recommend, right, as far as romance novel, Amish themed romance novels goes? Yeah, there's actually one Amish woman who herself writes romance novels. She is a member of the Old Order Amish Church in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and her name is Linda Byler. And um, some people jokingly referred to as the author of Fifty Shades of Hay. <laughs> 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 right? um, but anyway, she's a very, very gifted writer. She also writes historical fiction. Um, she's just a you know, very, it's a very, very interesting person. Um, her husband had had some uh, um, financial issues or whatever. He had had some problems with, uh, and, and, ba and basically the family went bankrupt. She had been writing basically stories and things for, you know, not for profit for years. And all of a sudden sh she discovered that there was a market there for uh, ri writings about the Amish. And she thought, well, I think I'm going to do it right kind of thing. So that's Linda Byler. That's the recommendation that I make. So where does the truth lie? This is not taken from reality TV. This image, which was taken without the awareness of the two young Amish women uh, who are featured here, this is also from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. This graces the cover of one of the really, really good objective books about the Amish that does an excellent job of clarifying a lot of the misunderstandings about the Amish and not putting them on a pedestal because they're human beings like all the rest of us but basically explaining in very, very direct and clear, objective terms who they are. And the title of that book is The Riddle of Amish Culture. And I like that title because it really, the Amish are a paradox. A lot of people say, well, wait, I thought they can't use, you know, cars, and yet I saw a van load stop at the Walmart Supercenter and unload a bunch of women going out and buying fabric, right? Um, there's like sort of lesson number one about who the Amish are and understanding the Amish is that they are not frozen in time, right? Amish today are not the same in terms of their lifestyle as say 50 years ago, 100 years ago, or 300 plus years ago when they first came to North America. There is only one aspect of their life that is basically unchanged for the last 300 plus years and that, are, that is the tenets of their faith and actually the structure of their church services. Their worship services really are, in their terms of the basic architecture of the service, like how they are, they, are, they are structured, is essentially unchanged for the last 300 years. And the hymnal that they use, which is a German hymnal, is the oldest Christian hymnal in continuous use in the world, right? But everything else is up for negotiation and change. So this, this image evokes that very nicely because Probably even 30 years ago, they weren't going around, you know, tooling around the back roads of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania on rollerblades, right? Nor were they we wearing acrylic or nylon wear. This is not cotton, right? Um, when you ask Amish women, it's like, don't you work with cotton? You know, isn't cotton better? And they say, have you ever tried to iron clothes, <laughs> right? That are made of cotton, right? And how much longer it takes for cotton to dry? I've got 10 people under this roof, right? 
We'll be talking a little bit more about laundry in a little while, but this is one thing where Amish women have basically said, this is great, right, <laughs> to have essentially acrylic, or they would say knit fabric, right, or um, uh, non-cotton fabrics. But really, ultimately, to understand who the Amish are, it's to, to get down to the fact that it's not about the buggy, it's not about the horses, it's not about living in an agrarian lifestyle, it's about their Christian faith, right? And so what we need to do is sort of set the Amish against the backdrop of the Christian family of churches. So imagine like a family tree, and there's a lot of branches on the Christian church. Um, but we will talk about sort of these basic tenets in a moment because it's very, very important. None of the sort of um, the barnacles on the ship or the sort of superficial aspects of their life make any sense unless you understand where they're coming from in terms of their Christian faith, right? That's what it all comes down to. So some, I've shared a little bit of history already, but basically the Amish are a Christian denomination that emerged as part of what's known as the Anabaptist movement um, in the history of Christianity, the Anabaptist, um, with what was known as in 500 years ago when this all started, the Radical Reformation. Now, as we'll see, a lot of the specific doctrines that were considered radical 500 years ago are very uncontroversial across many, many Christian, most Christian churches today. But 500 years ago, there were some very, very strict ideas about what was the proper faith and what was considered, in many cases, heresy. Um, so Anabaptist, the Anabaptist family of churches includes Mennonites. So like, for example, as I mentioned before, I'm a Mennonite. Although I'm not a plain Mennonite, most Mennonites are not plain, right? We're not, we don't differ in many outward ways from most of our neighbors. We don't limit the use of technology. Our di lifestyle differences are, are much less visible. Um, Mennonites, Amish, a group called the Hutterites. If those of you have maybe spent some time in, say, the Dakotas, Montana, um, Western Minnesota, there are some, but especially in the prairie provinces of Canada, you just go up from North Dakota, Manitoba, um, Saskatchewan, Alberta, that's the sort of major area where the Hutterites are. And then uh, churches, they're not represented in Wisconsin. We have Mennonites, we have Amish, and also Brethren, Churches of the Brethren, who are also known historically as German Baptists. And there are, for example, small groups of so-called old German Baptists. Closest to this area, I think, would be near Athens, so like headed more north and, and west um, toward uh, Marathon County. The Amish shorthand are a conservative splinter group off of Swiss Mennonites. So the Mennonites are the oldest. Um, the movement began on January 21st, 1525 in Zurich, Switzerland, which was a time when three uh, couples, um, husbands and wives, baptized each other um, as, a, as a sign of what we'll be talking about in a moment, so-called believer's baptism, which is core to understanding anabaptism. Um, theologically, there are very, very few differences across Anabaptists. It's really mostly lifestyle. Um, but theologically, the, the doctrines are very much the same. The name Mennonite goes back to an early Mennonite or Anabaptist leader whose name was Menno, Menno Simons. Um, in 1693, so 1525, you know, is the beginning of the Anabaptist movement, eventually mainstream known of the Anabaptists known as Mennonites. And then in the late 17th century, specifically around the year 1693, there was a Swiss probably convert to uh, Anabaptism, the Swiss Mennonites, um, who brought a certain amount of zeal with him, <laughs> zeal of the convert, and he eventually led a conservative splinter group of the, these Swiss Mennonites, also known in those days as the Swiss Brethren, um, and his name was Jakob Amman, and his followers became known as the Amish. Very little is known about Jakob Amman, most is known by historians, the Amish themselves have very little information about him. Um, one thing is clear, there are no more Amish with the name Amman, and it's almost certain that none of his kids actually remained Amish. <laughs> they all went back to the Mennonites, which is sort of an interesting thing. Um, Menno Simons is considered much more well-known because he left a large body of theological writings, which the Amish also draw on. Here's an image of Menno Simons. Menno Simons <clears throat> was a pretty much exact contemporary of Martin Luther. They didn't know one another personally, but Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, these great sort of names that you hear about, big names in the history of the Protestant Reformation, Menno Simons was one of their contemporaries. He was, like many of the early reformers, a former Catholic priest himself. Um, part of the reason that he's so well known among Anabaptists is he was really one of the very, probably the only, the only prominent leader among the Anabaptists that died a natural death. All the others were essentially martyred, which gives you an indication of why Anabaptists felt that compelled to migrate. And as I say, most came to the American colonies and then eventually Canada. Um, so today, there's a lot of diversity among, even within Amish, right? And Amish are just like one Anabaptist group. 
Um, and among Mennonites, even greater diversity. But basically, all of it is lifestyle, dress, and grooming. It's not really anything to do with theology. Um, the most traditional Amish and Mennonites are known as Old Order Amish or Old Order Mennonites. Both are represented in Wisconsin. I'll show you a map in a moment. But even among the Old Order groups, just among the Old Order Amish, there are over 40 different subgroups, right? And that spectrum is actually represented here in Wisconsin, from the very, very traditional to those that actually do use, for example, tractors for field cultivation. As I say, theological differences are, are minimal. It's really differences of technology. As I say, it, you know, the Amish population is growing rapidly, so every time I do an outreach presentation, I have to double check. It's like the, the national debt thing or whatever that's like going up. It's like, okay, as of this afternoon, <laughs> it's 383,000 as I say, across 32 U.S. states and four Canadian provinces. Wisconsin, it's kind of a surprise to some people, has the fourth largest Amish population. Which states would you say would be like one and two with Amish? Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania and Ohio, thank you, <laughs> right? And then Indiana's third. But Wisconsin's fourth, right? So it's a fairly sizable population. And there are about 5,000 old order Mennonites in Wisconsin. Um, this sort of little, you know, kind of Venn diagram type, type image here basically shows the difference between Amish and Mennonites according to a parameter that we haven't talked about yet. Um, one thing, in, in, a, a term that Tracy used in her introduction was that my work involves helping or assisting, especially in healthcare, so-called plain people. The term plain is a blanket term that describes all Amish, some Mennonites, and groups that would be sort of in that yellow band there, so like the German Baptists, the Hutterites, and similar groups. Um, plain just is a term that was borrowed from the Quakers, who welcomed the Amish and Mennonites and many other people see, seeking religious freedom to colonial Pennsylvania because the Quakers were also a persecuted religious minority in Great Britain, right? And they, if you look at the, imagine the Quaker Oats guy, right? He dresses plain. Into the 20th century, basically until about the middle of the 20th century, many Quakers still dressed plain, right? Um, they know, most of them no longer do. But the way that they would describe their dress is plain, right? And to, as a way of sort of basically expressing um, a humble lifestyle and modesty and not playing too much, placing too much value on one's outward appearance, right? Opposite of plain is fancy, right? So we hear the terms plain and fancy, right? That's, there was a, a Broadway play <laughs> that dealt with this supposedly with Amish many years ago, but that's the term. So plain and not, so like for example, I'm in that big pink circle there of non-plain uh, Anabaptists. A map of uh, some of the major settlements in Wisconsin. Um, it's essentially kind of central and western Wisconsin is very heavily covered. So most Wisconsin counties have an Amish presence. Um, I've adjusted the size of the plain quilts, <laughs> the simpler quilts of the communities. Anybody here know Vernon County, Wisconsin? Know about Vernon County? Vernon County has the largest concentration of plain people anywhere in the state percentage of the population is actually Clark County. Clark County, plain people, it's Amish and, and older Mennonites account for a third of the population and over 50% of the births. <laughs> Not surprisingly, right? So very, very large number of kids being born uh, to plain people everywhere, but then relatively speaking, it uh, is reflected in demographic facts like, like in, in uh, Clark County. Older Mennonites are basically concentrated in that sort of Clark, Taylor, Marathon area. Um, the communities of Thorpe and Withy um, have fairly large uh, horse and buggy or older Mennonite populations. And then way down in the southwest part of the state in Grant County, there are horse and buggy Mennonites there too. And it's always nice to look at cute kids, right? <laughs> Those are cute Amish Mennonite kids. Now, I don't expect you, don't put on your glasses, don't put on your, you know, magnifying, anything like that. Just look at the colors. That's all I'm asking you to do. I will explain to you what you need to, to, to take away from this slide here. This is taken from a, uh, a Wikipedia page, and there's a Wikipedia page on everything. The Wikipedia page on technology and the Amish, right? And this gives you a sense of the diversity within the old order Amish. I mentioned like 40 different subgroups plus this is just gives you about 20 of them right here. But what it does is it reflects the fact that it gives you a sense of some of the aspects of technology where there are differences, where different groups make different choices. So it's, it's kind of a nice sort of like safety valve in some ways, because if somebody you know, says, well, I love being Amish, but I'm not real thrilled about the technological profile of this community, well, then you move somewhere else, right? Amish are actually quite mobile. Your average Midwestern Amish family lives in five different communities 
over the course of their lives, right? And so that's, a, it's a, as I say, it's like, that's not so much a safety valve so much as it is a kind of a, a, a sort of a, it gives, opens up certain kinds of choices, right? So most conservative groups, including represented in Wisconsin, would be at the top of that left-hand column there. And then looking over from left to right, those are aspects of technology where there have been cho different choices have been made. So on the far left column there, aside from uh, next to the affiliations, are the use of tractor for field work. So the vast majority of Amish do not use tractors for field work. Many Amish communities allow tractors, but not for field work. They use it as basically like, a, like, a, like the PTO shaft in the back to run power tools and to run you know, hay balers and these kinds of things, um, but not uh, for, for field cultivation. Um, but some do, and there are some of those groups, those two little green groups down on the bottom, that's no for red and yes for green. Um, that's the, that's, that, that's a, a, some, there are some communities in Wisconsin that fall into the green category. Then let's move to the far right here, motorized washing machines. Now I said that women, Amish women have put their foot down about things like laundry. <laughs> there is a big difference between having a motorized washing machine and not having a motorized washing machine. That's a washboard, right? There's, not a, there's nothing in between that, right? And so they basically say, come on, <laughs> right? Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the washing machine and then dryers also as well and dishwashers. In other words, appliances in a moment because it's a very, very nice example of why and how they make certain choices as far as technology goes. So basically, effectively, all Amish communities have washing machines. Now, they're not the fancy front loader LG blah, blah, blah. They're ringer washers, but they are motorized. Right? We'll talk about that. So what are the core beliefs among all Anabaptists? So Amish, Mennonites, Hutterites, and Brethren. Basically, there are five major points, some of which I've already touched on here. The first is what's known as believer's baptism. Our churches practice what's known as, sometimes referred to as adult baptism. The idea behind this is that, that to be a Christian, is, it's not a birthright. You're not, no one's born a Christian. It's a decision that you, as a believer, should freely make of your own free will. It should not be something that your parents make for you, a decision that your parents make for you. Now, the vast majority of Christian churches still practice infant baptism, but in those churches, you are not a full member of the church at baptism. That's only the first step, right? And so mainstream Protestant churches, the Catholic church, this is exactly how, so it's, what happens with Anabaptism is basically it's all just kind of balled together at one time. You, you take instruction for baptism, and the average age is somewhere around 18, 19 years old, somewhere around there. Have instruction for baptism, have a very clear sense with your eyes wide open of what you're doing, and then once you've been baptized, you are a full-fledged member of that church, full voting member, male or female, equal rights there, and you're able to take communion, right? So it's like First Communion comes with baptism services as well. So it's known as believer's baptism. Um, 500 years ago, to say that church and state should be separated was fighting words, right? A very radical notion because church and state were completely intertwined with one another. Even to a certain extent today, there are very, very close relations between religious institutions and secular governments in a place like Germany, right? For example, where um, parochial schools, church-run schools, are actually under the supervision, the authority of the government. So in other words, teachers in any school have to be approved by the government. Rather different situation than what we have in the United States, right? But they receive government funding. Those schools receive government funding, whereas in this country, you can do whatever you want, create your own school, you're just not gonna get federal or state, state uh, funding for that school. Separation of church and state, Completely uncontroversial in the United States, but 300 years ago, that was a big deal, right? And even when the American Constitution, right, was passed in the 1780s, and this country was established, we were still the outliers as far as the rest of the world goes. Third major point is what they, they would refer to as becoming Jesus followers. They say that, you know, your faith is not just something that you should think about on Sunday mornings from 9.30 to 11. It's really how you live your life. It's what's in your heart. It's what you're doing on Wednesday afternoons. It's not what you're doing in a worship service so much as it's what you're doing with your neighbors. Your neighbors who are also Amish, your neighbors who are not Amish. The people that you get along with and have affection for and those that maybe you're, you know, you're not necessarily on the friendliest terms with. Discipleship is the watchword here. Um, meaning to follow Jesus' words and deeds. Now, theology is not a really big sort of area, even for members of the ministry among the Amish. 
and for some tr and many traditional Mennonites, they say, you know, the Bible is the inspired word of God from Genesis to Revelation, but in terms of like guidelines for everyday living, they say the gospels are a pretty good place to start, right? Because we have a model there. Jesus, who was a teacher, said some things fairly explicitly, like the Sermon on the Mount, things that were a little bit more, you have to think about it, like the parables, and they're just simply his actions, right? So they say, this is our model, right? And the, the cardinal virtue that they would ascribe to Jesus and that they strive to live for among them, themselves is humility, right? And that's not something that's necessarily really in line with a lot of outside or mainstream values. Humility is not something to say, I want my kid to be humble, right? It's not something that you hear a lot of parents in a lot of, say, modern societies saying, but that is the cardinal virtue among the Amish. You avoid the sin of pride. Fourth major point is what's known as nonconformity. Because the rest of the world is probably not really going to um, live according to values that are in line with your faith, you need to keep a little bit of distance from it. That being said, the Amish and related groups do not strive to be isolated completely. They say, one Amish guy told me once, he said, you know, Mark, he said, if we were to disappear from the face of the earth tomorrow, no one would miss us. And I'm saying, no, 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 that's not true. I would miss you. <laughs> and they say, but if the rest of the world disappeared tomorrow, we would go with them, right? They're completely dependent, even if not in an obvious way on the rest of society. Like, for example, the fabric, right? For example, those young women are wearing. They're not sitting at the spinning wheel with acrylic, right? They're buying, they're, they may not have electricity from the grid, but they're buying fuel and they're not extracting that fuel and then refining it to make kerosene and propane or gasoline right on their own. So they understand that they are distanced from the world, but not completely cut off from the world. So it's like, you could say almost like autonomous rather than independent from the world. Another example is they would say, okay, our take on Christmas is different from your take. So for a lot of outsiders, Christmas is like, you know, uh, holidays and you know the inviting people over parties baking shopping gifts stress cards these kinds of things and maybe Black Friday at Kohl's <laughs> or charcoal gray Thursday at Best Buy at th Thanksgiving they say can't we just kind of keep the Christ in Christmas <laughs> is their sort of attitude they say you know Christmas kind of gets really out of hand and you go down a lot of you know neighborhoods or whatever and you see the inflatable you know this and that and reindeers and that sort of thing they say you know maybe you know it's nice you know the food is fun it's nice to get together with people but it's not really a christian holiday at that point right and so that's where they would say we want to keep ourselves a little bit distant from it. they'll still make the cookies right they won't have christmas trees they won't have anything to plug their lights into so they don't have lights right but it's something that's little you could say basically the way that our grandparents and great-grandparents celebrated christmas right in the early 20th century or the late 19th century they mark this nonconformity symbolically just as sort of a statement through by by dressing and, dis and grooming themselves distinctively limiting but not forbidding technology that's what's referred to as bargaining with technology I'll give you an example in a moment and the language that they speak in addition to english they're all bilingual but it, English is not their first language. It's a very early language, but their first language is related to German. It's known as Pennsylvania Dutch, and that's the language that I speak. And then this fifth point here is non-resistance. I talked about that before, which is basically turning the other cheek, as Jesus enjoined us to do. Now, um, as I say, you know, the, the, the Amish and Mennonites were, suffered incredible persecution in Europe. That's why they were in, impelled to leave. There are some, there's a remnant still there, but the vast majority have thrived outside of Central Europe. One of the most famous stories of early Anabaptist suffering um, that's told to uh, Amish and, and young Mennonite kids to this day is represented in this image here. A, this man on the, represented on the left here is a Dutch Anabaptist leader from the Netherlands named Dirk Willems. And he was a very prominent Anabaptist leader who, like many prominent Anabaptist leaders, was arrested by the authorities. It was church and state working together with one another and told to recant or else he would be condemned to death. He, was, he, would, he would be executed. He said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Right? I'm not going to do that. At some point, after several weeks of incarceration, he escaped. We don't know under what circumstances, whether it was a sympathetic jailer or whatever, but he did escape. And he was running across a marsh in winter, and he had lost a fair amount of weight during that time, so he wasn't crashing through the ice. His uh, jailers heard what was going on and started to pursue him. At one point, one of the jailers crashed and fell into the, the, the freezing water and screamed for help. And Dirk Willems stopped, ran back, and pulled that man out and saved his life. 
The rest of the jailers came around him, rearrested him, and 10 days later he was executed. And the moral of the story is not that Dirk Willems should have kept running. It's that, more, that Dirk Williams did what he was called to do as a Christian. Now that's raising the bar very, very high. It's almost inconceivable, right, that the most singular form of violence, persecution, physical violence ever committed against Amish people did not happen in the Netherlands, did not happen in Switzerland. It happened in rural Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, going on 17 years ago this fall. This was one of the most notorious school shootings in American early, you know, the early history of school shootings. It's known as the West Nickel Mines, they would say incident. It's often refers to as the West Nickel Mines massacre. It was a mentally disturbed man who lived in this very, very uh, heavily Amish Mennonite community, had um, obviously very severe mental problems and made extensive preparations for what he was uh, intending to do and burst into that schoolhouse and sent all the boys out. One little girl escaped. The teacher and a pregnant mom who's there helping that day lined up 10 girls in the, front, in the front of the blackboard and shot each one of them execution style. Five of them were killed and uh, five survived. Um, two are very severely disabled to this day. And the thing that really struck, um, you know, it, and by uh, the, the teacher had called the SWAT team and from Lancaster County, it was all done like in, in I think an hour and a quarter or something like that and he took his own life at the end. And so um, by, it was all done by about like 11.30 that, that morning and you know, the community was in shock. The news just went around the world. It's like the most innocent among the innocent, right, being targeted. And um, about four o'clock that afternoon, a small delegation of Amish men, older men, who were friends with the shooter's father, came over to the shooter's now widow's house with their three little kids and his parents. And the shooter, Mr. Roberts' father, was inconsolable. He was bawling. Nobody in the family had any sense of what was going on, of what had happened. And the Amish are not particularly touchy-feely, huggy, and that sort of thing, but this one older Amish guy gives him a hug and says, we love you. And we know that you are suffering too. And so we will stand with you as you journey forward with your grief in the way that we are journeying forward with our grief. We can't turn the clock back, but we can look at where we are now and we can see where we're headed. This is what is known as sort of like almost instinctive forgiveness. And they take it directly from the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us, you know, our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, right? This basic, they say, you know, rage, revenge is not going to get you anywhere. The words of Martin Luther King Jr. in an earlier generation is saying, an eye for an eye leaves everybody blind, right? Coming from a very similar kind of pacifistic sort of view of things, a nonviolent view, resonate very, very strongly among the Amish and the Mennonites. There were millions of dollars of donations that came from around the world for the medical and burial expenses of these families. And there was immediately a committee of men, stewards put together to manage this fund, which still exists today. And they insisted that a certain percentage of that fund be dedicated in perpetuity for the shooter's um, kids, the three little kids that he had, as well as his widow, who's since remarried. There, there's like a, a, a one person play about this, right? There are a lot of different, um, or it's, it's written by a, a single author, but um, focusing on one character. And there are books, there have been, you know, um, documentary uh, programs about this too. The book that I highly recommend to understand, not the gory details about it, but the larger message of what forgiveness means in a practical sense and the challenge of forgiveness is this book, Amish Grace, How Forgiveness Transcended Tragedy. Very, very, very powerful message. So, talking about economic profiles, virtually all Amish live in rural areas. I say virtually because there's a small urban community in Sarasota, Florida. Anybody ever been to Sarasota? That's the only Amish community that lives within a metropolitan area. It started as snowbirds, <laughs> right? Who, like a lot of Yankees, find it a little bit, the, the winter's a little bit long. It's now a year-round community. They had a little bungalow community that's known as Pinecraft, and basically uh, the rest of Sarasota just kind of expanded that. So that's the, an urban Amish community. They also have electricity and don't operate horse and buggies because the traffic in Sarasota <laughs> just not conducive to that. They're also into e-bikes down there now. 
So the most, essentially all of them live in rural areas, but you'd be maybe surprised to know that less than 18%, somewhere like between around 17, 18%, Use, depend on farming or agriculture as their main source of income. The vast majority of Amish, because of the challenges for small-scale family farming, learned very early on that you have to diversify. So they'll basically all have gardens, right? And these gardens are pretty serious gardens, right? In terms of like farm-to-table type stuff. But in terms, and they may sell truck produce. But in terms of like their main source of income, it's typically going to be a business of some kind. So one of the draws of Amish and other plain people to Wisconsin is the access to lumber. And so doing things like furniture, home remodeling, um, cabinet making, you know, lots and lots of businesses that are essentially rural adjacent but are not agriculturally based, right? Now, Wisconsin has a somewhat higher percentage of farmers um, among the Amish than in other states, like northern Indiana, the vast majority are working in trailer and factories, right, the RV companies, um, where the money is actually quite good. But uh, farming is and almost non-existent in a place like Arthur, Illinois, there's like five Amish families left, the rest are all businesses. Furniture, Amish craftsmen, it's considered very, very uh, um, desirable. And then things like bulk food stores and bakeries. Oh, bakeries, oh my gosh. <laughs> The baked goods are just phenomenal. Community is important. There's no such thing as being an Amish person and being a hermit. It just, it just wouldn't work, right? You're constantly surrounded by other people. A lot of people think, oh, you know, it's you know, so much kind of like not a whole lot of private space. And they say, yep, there's not a lot of private space. And we really like that. Especially older people. And older people never live in retirement communities or rest homes, nursing homes, that kind of thing. They're always cared for at home. Even if they have fairly extreme medical needs, right? They'll be cared for at home. They say, I feel so much younger because I've got my kids and my grandkids and typically their great grands there, right? Amish people tend to retire relatively early in comparison to their neighbors. They're retiring in their 60s because if they've had kids and their kids have had kids, then they're typically already great grandparents in their early 60s. And there's a large need for childcare. Right, so there's grandma and grandpa, Hardy and Hale in their early 60s, works out great. Amish life expectancy has always been high, it's slightly higher than the US average, right? So it's up in the 80s. Food, the seafood diet is basically a part of the Amish cuisine. You see food, you eat it, it's just fine. They take between 17 and 19,000 steps a day, right? They get a lot of, lot of physical activity. So yeah, I mean, there's some processed sugars in there, but most of it is not processed otherwise. A lot of farm to table, uh, foods, um, not much in the way of red meat, and just a lot of exercise, right? Just a lot of exercise. Exercise like young people, and then playing uh, games with, with, you know, just, you know, kind of healthy outdoor activities, like this cute little baby record. So um, I mentioned, you know, sort of marking their nonconformity um, through, their, through their outward appearance. Uh, Amish, you know, dress is very similar to the concept of wearing uniforms, right? We all wear things that demonstrate our affiliation by choice. Like for example, I'm wearing something, this Badger Talks, right, that I got from UW-Madison. Um, in other circumstances, one would see a lot of green and gold, right? <laughs> or red and white, yay, <laughs> you know, something like that. We mark our affiliations and our, our affections, right, um, through our dress. I just went to Quick Trip. Everybody at Quick Trip was wearing something that said Quick Trip on it. We all have graphic things. Somebody's got a pickleball shirt. I like that shirt a lot. He li I'm, I'm assuming he likes pickleball, right? So basically, it's sort of like, you know, their green and gold is more sort of black and white, right? And other kinds of nice pastel colors, but sort of like go Amish rather than go pack. So let's talk about technology. You have three appliances here. One is a fixture in all, every Amish home, and the two are never there. So the dryer, no Amish have dryers. Washers, again, not the fancy you know, front loader washer, but they have wash motorized washing machines, and none has a dishwasher. And you think, well, wait, why is one appliance okay and what are the other two not? Amish logic, right? The Amish logic is this. First of all, it's not particularly efficient to run a dryer on a small Honda motor. You can run a washing machine pretty well. There's a little Honda motor down there, just like a gas-powered motor. That's easy. But dryers, you can't really hack them or retrofit them. But they say, but we've got a wonderful dryer outside, which is the air, right? Mm -hmm. And we've got a lot of space to run out of line. And who doesn't like line dry, the smell of line dried laundry? And guess what? Even in winter, yeah, it may get a little bit stiff, right? <laughs> but it'll dry fairly quickly, right? Often because it's, it's fairly dry. So washing machine, 
and then the, the dryer there. But then you say, but why not a dishwasher here? Isn't it sort of like a time-saving device? There's a fundamental difference between the activity of washing dishes and the activity of washing clothes. Washing clothes is a very solitary individual activity, right? It's not a group sort of thing, right? However, with washing the dishes, you can get a three or four year old who's like helping to move the dishes, and they're not, they're all plastic, <laughs> off of the table, taking it. There's not gonna be a lot to scrape, but just to, to prep them, wash them, rinse them, dry them, and put them away. And what are you doing there? You're joking, you're singing, you're splashing water, you're having a good time, and you're teaching the little kids it is fun to do work, right? They say, why would I, you know, and they, people think, oh, washing dishes, and they say, yes, washing dishes. Like, oh, work, yes, work, because it's an excuse for people to get together and enjoy one another's company. When it comes to technology, um, the telephone is kind of a sort of a major kind of question mark among the Amish. Every Amish person has access to a telephone just in different ways. The Amish in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania were very quick to adopt telephones when they came out in the early 20th century. And then they realized you can have too much of a good thing because you can have a telephone in the middle of your house and it rings and it's disturbing you or in your pocket or your purse or your backpack or that kind of thing. How many times have we been had that experience and somebody's phone goes off, right? That kind of thing. It's great to have the access, but they say it's kind of like a tool. My power drill does not tell me when to pick it up and start drilling, right? But it's there when I need it. And so they say, let's just not have our phones in our homes. Let's have them in the shed, in a shack, and the neighbor's basement where I pay for the line, right? Many Amish have voicemail, so families will have a community phone, push one for Amos, two for Leroy. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a wonderful kind of compromise or setting a check on technology that's not unlike the choices that a lot of parents make in terms of limiting screen time. Now, in my generation, our generation, it was limiting prime time, right? Sh shut off the TV at nine o'clock or something like that. Nowadays, we talk about limiting screen time, right? And the Amish basically do this kind of collectively. So the last bait, or second to last thing I'm going to be sharing, you, sharing with you is an example of the language, the last sort of major symbol of community identity. How many people here know some German? You know some German, a little bit of German? Okay, Pennsylvania Dutch is related to German, but is no longer mutually intelligible with it. So a German sees and hears this and they say, I can pick out individual words, but I don't understand it. It's typically an oral language. The vast majority of their literacy happens in English. This is an example of a book of children's Bible stories written in Pennsylvania Dutch for Amish parents to read to their kids. This is the creation story. So you guys know the plot, right? So I don't need to translate it. I just want you to get a sense of what Pennsylvania Dutch sounds like in the way that a parent would, speak, would tell a Bible story to their child. The title of the book is Vele Lesa, which means let's read. And the subtitle is Bible Stories for Kinnel, Bible Stories for Children. Stories is the word taken from English. Da stert von die Erd. We lang zurück als kein Erd gehabt, kein Leid, kein Helling. Es war alles just dunkel gewest. Verstärkt mit hat Gott de Himmel und die Erd gemacht. Nur ich sagt, lass es Licht sein. Just wie sel war es Licht gewest. Gott hat das Licht da gekissen und das Dunkel Nacht. Das war nur der erste Tag, das Leben war. Der nächste Tag hat er die Wolke gemacht, er hat er die Luft gemacht, so dass man schnaufen kann. Auf den dritten Tag hat das Wasser und das Land verdehlt. Er hat das See und die Himmel gemacht, so der Tag. Er hat noch gesagt, lass die Beam und das Gras sterben wachsen. Und sie haben noch gesterben wachsen. Right? But you didn't know that God also spoke Pennsylvania Dutch. Right? <laughs> Quotes here. I've made some reference to their healthy lifestyle. It's a very healthy lifestyle. Their baseline health is extremely good. Um, this is just taken from an article that was appeared in Time Magazine five years ago. Amish pe people stay healthy in old age. Here's their secret. Active lifestyle, excellent immune health, very, very low rates of asthma and allergies. Just overall wound healing if they're injured is very, very short wound healing times. Lower rates of the three big morbidity predictors, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes, overall lower. A lot of family and community stability, which is a huge factor in recovery times, especially with elders, right? Feeling that their needs are going to be, or be met, social as well as medical. Strong support and care for the elderly. I mentioned before that they are cared for at home if they need it. 
And a lot of people think closed societies, there's, there's bad genes. Yes, there are certain genetic disorders that occur in their communities larger than, in, at a higher rate than in some outside communities, but their good genes are also in there too. The vast majority of the world's societies are so-called closed or nearly closed societies. All of our ancestors, I mean, we go back and we've got second and third cousins marrying one another quite frequently. The Amish population is almost identical to that of Iceland. And very interestingly, Iceland is also a closed society because it is Iceland. <laughs> People don't move to Iceland, right? It's not a religious community. And what was very interesting, they did it, they do all kinds of genetic studies on Icelanders and they found that the greatest or the highest uh, fertility rates and with the greatest sort of um, uh, overall positive health outcomes among kids are between couples who are related to one another at a degree of third or fourth cousin. It drops off with second, but it also drops off at fifth or higher. So in a sense, there's kind of nature in a sense, you know, has sort of selected for the fact that our ancestors for the vast majority of our human history could not walk far enough away from people to find partners who were not related to one another. And so in our modern 21st century day American society, we think, oh, you know, it's like it's bad to be related. It's actually not necessarily a bad thing in terms of from a genetic profile. The last thing I'm going to leave you with here is this is uh, basically why are Amish so happy? <laughs> They're very happy people, right? And this was something that I found from just a couple of years ago reading the New York Times. This was an article, an op-ed piece that talked about why liberals and conservatives are so grumpy. <laughs> I mean, a lot of it has to do with our political situation. There's no question about that. But they often found that, that liberals tend to be, people on the left side of the spectrum, tend to be more unhappy than people on the right side of the spectrum. Don't exactly know why that's necessarily the case, but they found this. They said, you know what? What is the secret to happiness? And they'll say, this is the, coming from a view of sociology. And this was their takeaway. They say, individual happiness is more likely to be found not by directly pursuing it, but by embracing social institutions that call on us to focus first on the welfare of others. And that those, the, the, those words are often like on little plaques or signs in Amish and Mennonite homes. Jesus first, before others and yourself last. That is the source of true joy. And they say, I get much more happiness by making other people happy first, right? Rather than just focusing on myself. And there's social science to back that up. All right, with that, thank you for coming up, thank you for coming and listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And I will, I will repeat the questions if some, if just to make sure that everybody's able to hear. Yes, sir, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, I live in Marion, which is a pretty substantial Amish community. It was on your map there. And, uh, where, where, I'm sorry, where did you, what's your home community? Marion, Marion. 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 Yeah. Yeah, so that's a very common uh, belief that bishops call the shots. They really don't. They manage things. These are, Amish communities are democratic. Every baptized male and female in the church has a vote. Bishops are not bosses. Some personality-wise may be a little bit bossier, but it is not. It's a very, I would say, basic democratic structure. To outsiders, everybody assumes that it's a conservative religious community. It's got to have a hierarchy. It has a hierarchy only in the sense that the ministry is such that there, there is a ministry. Bishops perform weddings and funerals and conduct baptisms. They are the spokespersons for a community, but they are not the bosses. They are not the leaders of the community at all. It's a very, very common view on the outside. Just the other day at the UW University Hosp or Children's Hospital, we had a so-called care conference right, to talk about a little boy who um, had acute liver failure, just got a liver transplant last week and things are headed in the right direction. And one of the nurses had said, but doesn't the family have to get the permission of the bishop to make certain choices? And I said, no. I said, they may consult with the bishop for advice on like how to manage some things with finances. I said, but bishops are not bosses. 
they have authority over certain religious things, but they really have to defer to their congregations. It's a very, very common view from the outside. Again, because people want to think it's a conservative religious community. It, ha it can't be democratic. It has to be top down, like a cult or something like that. But that's, that's not the case. Yes? I have a question. I, going back years, I've had different uh, interactions with Amish. And I've always been worried that I'm going to do something uh, wrong or uh, you know, commit a faux pas. I mean, like, uh, should I offer my hand? Uh, now I actually have friends who are Amish, and mm -hmm. I've hired their company numerous times. And even then, by the way, if you offer them a Pepsi, they'll take it every time. <laughs> <laughs> are, are there things we could do better or should do or should know about? What a wonderful question to ask. That's a really nice question to ask. First of all, <laughs> We're going to have coffee a quick trip afterward. <laughs> um, so first off, the Amish are, are always a minority. They're always surrounded by non-Amish people. So they don't expect everybody else to be Amish. <laughs> they don't expect other people to kind of do like they do, to dress like they do, that kind of thing. Um, you know, there are certain things that they, um, well, let me give you one very concrete example. If a woman's pregnant, and pregnancy is a very, very common situation, you don't talk about it explicitly. You don't say, oh, something's happened in how many months? You know, that kind of thing. There's a very kind of traditional um, caution about pregnancy. Um, it's a completely natural thing. The vast majority of babies are born at home, but you don't talk about it explicitly. In Pennsylvania Dutch, there is no word for pregnant. You basically say expecting. You use all these metaphors. Expecting, you know, carrying a little, you know, a few extra pounds in the front, you know, these kinds of things. Very open that way but not in terms of like saying she's going to have a baby and you would never, ever, ever, ever have a baby shower. Never. Well, I'm saying I wasn't trying to Yeah, I'm, I'm figuring, yeah. <laughs> you're not going to be hosting that. But I mean like talking, talking about pregnancy. They will talk about health. They'll talk a lot about health as a matter of fact. But pregnancy is something that you just, that's a, it's a topic that is, is just not a public kind of thing to talk about. That's one thing that I would say. It's kind of different from our mainstream society where we not only have baby showers, we have gender reveal parties. And we have people sending cards that have like sonogram images on them. And they would say, I hope everything goes OK, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. No, it's very, very cautious, yeah. Does that tradition go back to a time when infant mortality was quite yes. high? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, you know, I spent a lot of time in Germany the vast majority of Germans would never have, couples would never have a, a, a baby shower. So many American things are kind of coming in, and one of them is the, what's called baby potty, right? It's a baby shower. But it's considered, there's some kind of very, very long standing, they would say, they would use the term bad omen, right? Because it's a very secular society, but it goes back to exactly what you're talking about. I'll give you a very example, a clear example from our family. We have one daughter. We lived in Germany for a year when she turned five, right? She, we were there when she was four and then turned five. And her birthday is on April 30th. And so we were going to have the kids at our little uh, play group all over for a, a party and for her birthday. And her birthday was on a um, Friday that year. And May 1st, the next Saturday, which is when we wanted to have the party, it was a big holiday. So everybody was going to be traveling. So we said, well, we'll just do it on the, on the, the Saturday before. And so we you know, got everything planned. And one of the moms said, so is her birthday actually on that day? And I said, no, no, it's actually five days later. I said, no, no, you can't do that. You cannot have a birth, you cannot celebrate a birthday or congratulate anybody on a birthday before the actual day. There's a German verb for that, which means literally to celebrate before. You may not do that. It's sort of like, you know, black cat crosses your path or walk under the, you know, whatever, these kinds of things. So yes, it goes back to a time when everybody had to be cautious because so many kids did not make it past either birth or infancy. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, we talked a little bit before. 1960s, I got dropped into eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, my dad's company decided to open a factory, industrial park. They brought 40 families in from New York State and things like that. It was a community where I went to high school, Quaker Town Community High School. Uh, as I mentioned, we had a lot of Mennonites, a few Amish, but not many Amish. But virtually everybody was German. There was a, and probably Lutheran. And I know from some of the social things I did with the Lutherans that German was spoke in their churches and things and their communities and 
And, uh, is that the same Pennsylvania Dutch as the Mennonites would be speaking? That a non, you know, a Lutheran German would be speaking the same? A great question. So Pennsylvania Dutch, the language is associated with the Amish because they're the main speakers today. For most of the history of the language, and it developed starting in like the mid 18th century, mid 1700s, the vast majority were Lutheran and Reformed. Some Catholics, some Jews, some Amish, Mennonites, and related groups, but the vast majority were mainstream Protestants, in almost equal parts Lutheran and Reformed. And what's very interesting for those who say um, are, have connections to the uh, Lutheran pastorate, you go to a place like Eastern Pennsylvania and you see a lot of so-called union churches. Do you know what a union church is? It's a church building that is equally shared by a historically Lutheran and Reformed congregation. They say, in terms of the grassroots uh, Protestant faith that they were living, theological differences were trivial. So the proximity between Lutheran and Reformed, which was a big deal in Europe, was not a big deal in the 18th century and then into the, literally the 21st century. There are still congregations today that are sharing Lutherans and it's now part of UCC, right? So the United Church of Christ. They're just like Lutherans at nine o'clock, the UCC congregation at, at 11 o'clock. Part of it was also efficiency. They say, we've got, why do we need one church house, <laughs> you know, or two church houses for two congregations when we can get by with just one church house? Because you didn't need the fellowship hall and the, all these other things or whatever, basically including the ministers. They just went to their homes, right? It was basically only used for worship services and occasional midweek worship services. So there's good German efficiency. They say, well, let's just, you know, maximize the use of it here kind of thing. So, yes, the vast majority of Pennsylvania Dutch speakers were um, so-called fancy Dutch. They were not the plain people at all. Um, the oldest and uh, I think largest continuous celebration of folk culture, a regional culture in America, is the so-called Kutztown Folk Festival. Kutztown is in Berks County, Pennsylvania, which is sort of the, the original settlement area of the Pennsylvania Dutch. And that's a celebration of Pennsylvania Dutch culture. So things like what are referred to as hex signs by outsiders, barn stars, quilts, um, funnel cakes, you know, shoe fly pie, these kinds of things. The Amish and Mennonites are kind of part of that tapestry, but a very, very small part. Yes. Yes. That's an excellent question. Now, the Amish have very, very close relationships to their animals, especially their horses. Horses are like members of the family in many ways. Question about dog breeders, right? Dog breeding is not an uncommon profession among the Amish. There are laws as, and regulations about how those businesses should be conducted. And the Amish say, look, you know, there's this reputation of Amish dog breeders as being puppy, having puppy mills and abusing their animals. They say, why on earth would we do that? First of all, God, dogs are part of God's creation as well. But beyond that, it's bad business, right? If we're abusing animals, we're not going to be able to sell those animals and make a profit. So again, it's one of those things where you Google Amish and dog, dog breeders, and you'll find all kinds of stories out there about puppy mills. There was a story that there was a story on WTMJ4, which is the big NBC affiliate in Milwaukee some years ago. It was like their investigative reporter type thing or whatever. And I remember seeing the teasers for that the entire week, and you see like a buggy going down a country road in northern Wisconsin. They say, they say there are people of faith, clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop, that kind of thing. And so I thought, well, what is this? You know, are they profiling actually Amish or Mennonite dog breeders? No, they were actually profiling with secret cameras really bad, nasty dog breeders who happened to live in proximity to Amish and Mennonites, but themselves were not Amish or Mennonites. So, you know, yes, there have been some cases of that. Those cases make it into the news, like the abuse cases. There are cases of abuse. But to go from like saying that the, there are cases of sexual abuse to say that Amish are abusers or Amish culture leads to that, or that there have been some very bad unethical dog breeders and that all Amish or Mennonite dog breeders are, are abusing their animals, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a step too far.
feelings, but um, I'm, I'm saying as I used to work at the Humane Society, for example, and um, the Humane Society actually partnerships with a lot of the Amish people um, because that, the Amish, they can't sell the puppies, they'll drown them, or if a dog gets too protective over their young, they'll shoot it. And so they, they try to partner with them to um, find homes for those. So what I'm saying is, it's like I really believe the mistreatment of animals is out there. And I agree. With the horses, if a horse becomes lame or too old, you know, then the horse is taken to auction and sold for the last few dollars they can get for it. Um, because isn't it true that the Amish have a belief that you have to be able to, to work? No. Then why would their elders be able to retire at need in the in their early 60s? Now, yes, they look. I'm a dog owner. I would I bought my or acquired we acquired our dog from the Humane Society. We adopted a rescue dog. I don't feel comfortable with many dog breeders. Just the whole industry of dog breeding makes me feel very uncomfortable. Okay, I don't like that. Yeah, and I, don't like the dog I that's we've always had mutts. <laughs> Well, again, it's you know, on certain circumstances, they will, you know, like, in a sense, kind of euthanize their animals in the way that outside pet owners euthanize their animals by shooting them rather than taking them to the vet. That is true. There's no question about that. It's not something that I want to even consider with my own pet, but we may go that, that route at some point to think about euthanization. Look, animals are part of God's creation. They are not inclined to being cruel or heartless or viewing animals as, as dis expendable or disposable. At a very minimum, horses are extremely expensive, right, in terms of their, you know, for, a, for families that don't have a large, large disposable income. Do they feel the same kind of affection towards animals as a lot of us, myself included, outsiders do? Probably not as much. So I'm on your emotional wavelength in what you're saying there. I validate your feelings because I share those feelings. Um, yes, sir, and then, yeah. Um, I believe there used to be an Amish community between here and Amherst. Yes, it was called the Amherst community, yes. And I, I'm not, I have not noticed anything the last few years. They moved, they moved, yeah. They moved on. Yep, they moved on. The reasons why communities don't sort of take or disperse, a variety of reasons, it can be economic, um, it can be disagreements within, you know, families not getting along. I mentioned the sort of mobility of moving in different areas. Um, I'm sure human beings like everybody else, and sometimes people don't get along, and they're not happy. I visited the, um, the Amherst community many years ago, like 30 years ago, when it was just kind of tapering off, and came down from Bondwell, Bond in Shawano County. There's a fairly good-sized community there. And basically, they were, they were saying it's just like, yeah, it just, you know, the, the, it just didn't have the sort of, uh, sustainability or whatever. It was a blend of personalities and also some folks felt economically there weren't as many economic opportunities for them. That's what I understood. But it's not unusual for settlements to, to not thrive. That's absolutely true. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to ask about taxes. Do the Amish pay state and federal income taxes? Yes. They do. And they, they have, do they pay the, Social Security also? No, if they're self employed. So they are exempt from Social Security and Medicare withholdings because they will not collect it in principle. They refuse on religious grounds to accept any government assistance. So like COVID stimulus checks, they were donating them to charity or trying to send them back and that kind of thing. They don't accept government assistance. And so they're, and so they're also, um, it, there's a, an exception to the Affordable Care Act that they're not, there's no, they're not required to purchase private health insurance. They're self-pay patients. They pay out of pocket using mutual aid without profit. But so when there was, it was like in the 1950s that the Social Security, they approached the Social Security Administration, they said, we're giving you all this, but we're not getting anything from it. Can we at least just be exemption, exempt from that withholding? And they say, yes, if you're self-employed. But if Amish are employed by non-Amish employers, like in Northern Indiana, they work in these big trailer factories, then it's just gift to the government. They have to have the Social Security and the Medicare withholding. And take care of the elderly, the yes. people. Yep, and there are no pensions. They just, their needs are taken care of. There's no, no worries, yeah. Yes. 
do they, the question is, do they believe in banks? And the answer is yes, they bank. Do they have like what I refer to as a community chat? No. They do have uh, like an emergency fund typically for um, medical uh, expenses because medical expenses are very quickly catastrophic. This is one of the main things that I help out with is like our system of healthcare is the business side. We, it's wonderful on the provider side. The business side has a lot of problems. And the people who get the shortest end of the stick are self-pay patients, those who do not have Medicaid, Medicare, or uh, private insurance. It's extremely challenging. But there is a community chest only managed for, for those kinds of, or like if somebody's house burns down or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, 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 but not a bank. Um, um, I've got a few bunch of, bunch of hands, but I'll get back to you, yeah. Yes, ma'am. I was just wondering, do the Amish typically vote in local state and federal elections? Rarely. Um, great question about politics. Um, so part of the whole separation of church of state is they say, we don't want the state to tell us what to do, so we're not going to tell you what to do by voting. Um, there's nothing, there's no prohibition against it. They choose not to do that. Now, in the lead up to the 2016 election, there was a PAC, a, a, a you know, political action committee that was set up to, on behalf of Donald Trump, to target Amish people in where they live in swing states, right? Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, that kind of thing. And there were billboards and that sort of thing. And one of the many pieces of misinformation that seems to have emerged from a lot of political stuff was that the Amish were responsible for um, flipping places, states like Pennsylvania. And that has been borne out to be completely false because political scientists can actually trace, you can get all the information on voter rolls, you can figure out exactly who's Amish, not Amish by their address and by their name. And the percentage of people that voted in the 2016 election was tiny. It was nothing that could have made any sort of difference in terms of flipping Pennsylvania or Ohio. But that view is out there, go on the internet, it's the Amish support Trump and all this other stuff. Politically, their sympathies would be, they would, they're described before 2016 as armchair Republicans, meaning like the sort of like low, lo, less government, lower taxes, con more conservative social values that they would kind of consider themselves um, Republicans. The president that they had in, the, in recent memory that they had the greatest affection for was actually George H.W. Bush. <laughs> they really liked George H.W. Bush. And then his son George W. Bush was also considered that way. In terms of sort of like kind of moral bearing, Jimmy Carter is just at the top of the list. I think that what, who Jimmy Carter is and what Jimmy Carter has done post-presidency is just phenomenal. And many Amish and Mennonites have visited him when he was still teaching Sunday school in Plains, Georgia, just to hear Jimmy Carter teach Sunday school. So education, great question. So formal education is limited to eight grades. Some choose to get a GED um, for you know, work-related purposes or something like that, but they say the most important learning happens on the job. <laughs> you don't need to be, uh, have a college education to be an Amish person. Now for those Amish people that, for whatever young people growing up in Amish families that decide that they really wanna go to college, they probably won't join the Amish church. And there are, you know, doctors, no lawyers that I know of, but a fair number of healthcare professionals who have Amish roots. Um, healthcare is sort of an interesting draw. The small number of Amish people that pursue post-secondary education, which is typically like an associate's degree, rare circumstances, a bachelor's degree, are females that are going into healthcare, nursing. But that's not true of Mennonites. Sorry. Mennonites, there are Mennonite colleges. So for example, Goshen College in Indiana is like probably a half dozen fairly well known among Mennonites uh, colleges and Goshen is the most famous one. Uh, there are a couple of questions over there on the side, yeah. Okay, the Amish usually do not have electricity or water in their homes except for a hand pump. Um, most have actually running water. Some do have pumps, but nobody, almost nobody has electricity. Some do, but most don't, that's correct. So that's the Rumspringa question. <laughs> so it's, um, that's a very, very misunderstood aspect of Amish life. Rumspringa is a Pennsylvania Dutch word, means to run around. Sounds wild. Even Wikipedia gets this one wrong, so don't look at Wikipedia on this. When you turn 16 or 17, depending on your community, 
you are permitted to socialize with other young people without adult supervision. That's what Roomspring is. You can date. It's not going out into the world or your parents sending you or sowing your wild oats or experimenting or anything like that. Yeah, there are some that go wild, right? In the same way that reflect on your high school classes. There was that percentage of those who were smoking cigarettes behind the gym and you know, whatever, that kind of thing. It's less common in Wisconsin because it's a lot of small settlements. It happens more in larger settlements, right? Um, I see this at my university on Thursday and Friday and Saturday nights, right? There's, there's an element of that. Amish youth are youth as well. But the stories that make it into the news, right, are the racy ones, like the drunk kid, you know, arrested, pulled over for, you know, drunk driving with a buggy and, you know, the kegger parties and stuff in Ohio. Those are all true stories. They're just not typical. So it, all it means is that they're able to socialize with one another without adult supervision, and that's it. Uh, you, sir? Yeah. We have a friend and associate who actually hired him. He's a contractor for us. And <coughs> I'm sure at one time or another, he was a, a practicing Amish uh, member of the church. Mm -hmm. And since then, has stepped on the, the dark side, or whatever it may be, as far as they're concerned. Um, he's been kind of ostracized a little bit from the community, yet he's still very much practicing his religious beliefs, uh, but he's not dressing it. He's riding around in a $40,000 pickup truck, mm -hmm. and uh, he's got all the electric tools, and he's a fantastic craftsman, but he's very cautious in when he deals with other people in his community because he's worried about offending one of them that are towing the line there, that the bishop may not yeah. seem kindly to his association with them since he's been kind of ostracized. Is that Again, don't give too much too much authority to bishops. <laughs> it's okay. not a top down sort of situation. It's fairly it's, it's, it's a really good question. It's very straightforward. You either a member of the church or you're not. If you're not in the church, the rules don't apply to you. As I say, it's somewhere between 10, maybe 15%. It's more like in the 10% range of kids born to Amish parents make the decision not to join the church. There is a handful of people that are baptized, that join the church, and then make the decision later to leave. It happens. It's very, very rare. That's a different story because then they've, in a sense, kind of gone back on a promise that they've made. So most, uh, all Amish parents want to see their kids make that choice and, and join the Amish church and be happy, right? They want that. If they're going to not join the church, they say better to do that before baptism than afterward, right? That's the way that they look at it. So there's that sort of sensibility. That being said, every single Amish family has at least one close relative who's not Amish. You go to any sort of like extended family reunion, like it could be 500 people on, you know, someplace in Indiana or whatever in the summer. It's like summer's big time for family reunions. There's always going to be Amish kids and little kids running around and you know shorts and not Amish and that kind of thing. It may be a couple generations removed. It may be their parents did leave or something like that. But um, it's you know part of the reason that you know they say you know they do practice church discipline, right? There are rules. It's not just do it, do as you please, and they see that as like kind of necessary. They also, for example, don't allow divorce, right? There are some Amish people whose partners, typically females, whose husbands have left them and filed for divorce. They leave. That woman cannot remarry until he is no longer living because it's not so much the divorce as the remarriage thing. Is that harsh? Yeah, it is. But the way they see it is like, well, on the positive side, people choose very carefully when they decide to get married. They say, this is for life until death do us part. This is not a choice that a lot of outsiders will make. This is why. Almost nobody joins the Amish. Out of the 370 whatever thousand Amish today, there's probably 200 that were not born to Amish parents. Tiny. That were left. About 200 who were not born to Amish parents joined from the outside. Mm -hmm. 50 years ago, more common. 100 years ago, rather common, because the difference between being Amish and not Amish was not all that great. <laughs> it was everything, you know. Women, women wore skirts, didn't cut their hair, wore coverings. Men wore hats when they walked outside. No one had electricity. <laughs> Right? It's the gap has really widened over the last second half of the 20th century. And it's interesting because the retention rate has gotten that much higher. 
used to be in the 1950s is about a 50-50 chance that kids born to Amish parents would stay Amish. And those 50% typically went to a conservative Mennonite church. Today, it's quite rare that people not join the church because they see the huge difference between being Amish and not Amish. And they say, I don't, I don't want to give all that up. And it's not about the stuff. It's about the family life. It's about the support. It's about somebody having your back, especially when you get older. Not having to worry about pensions. Not having to worry about being alone. Even if you were never married, your needs will be taken care of. There's no difference. They have to do, I mean, they're, they work with funeral homes to prepare the bodies that are embalmed. They have their own pine boxes and that sort of thing. But in terms of like records, they have birth certificates, they have death certificates, they have wills, <laughs> they have all the same kinds of documents that outsiders have. Um, the birth the people are getting a lot more conscientious about keeping their birth certificates now because you need it to cross the border in Canada if you don't have a photo ID. It used to be this, I don't know, whatever, it was pretty flexible. Um, but nowadays, if you don't have a photo ID, which the vast majority of them don't have, then they need a you know, social security card or, or a birth certificate. A birth certificate is easier to get across the border. No. Oh, yeah, I asked about also the burial only because it was, I don't know if it's fact or there's any truth behind it or it's misunderstood, but I, I had um, uh, a person state to me that the Amish have their own personal cemeteries and that when their individuals pass away, and again, we make a generalization statement, um, that that's not like monitored or, or the burials no. aren't necessarily reported because no. they take care of their own. Okay, um, they do have community cemeteries, like in the same way the churches have cemeteries. They have their own cemeteries. But the records are all, you can find them in the county, and you actually you can go on findagrave.com and find a lot of Amish cemeteries, and people go through and, and write down the names if they're not, I mean, they do, it's just, they're, they're not exempt <laughs> from the basic kinds of sort of vital statistic information that the rest of people have, right? They, they have to do that. And one thing is like, for example, typically the, the land that's set aside for their schools and cemeteries is just donated from somebody from the community. But in order to get the permit to have a cemetery, you have to make sure that it's not close to a water, body of water or a creek or something like that. There are all kinds of zoning regulations about, you can't just like, you know, anybody, nobody can do this, like bury somebody in your backyard or something like that. So they have to follow all those rules. They're, they're, they're not hiding, they're not off the grid that way. But they do have their own cemeteries, just like churches do. Yeah. I wonder what the relationship is between males and females. You know, our culture is very male oriented and um, women play second fiddle in a lot of cases. We're still striving, but. So uh, how is the Amish relationship between male and female? That's a great question. There was a friend of mine, older Mennonite woman who has 14 kids. And I was chatting with her once. I said, you know, when was it really hard and she said at number six or seven, she said, because number one wasn't able to make dinner yet. But after that, it was pretty easy. I just kind of took care of the baby and managed things. And she said, oh, I get comments all the time from my female neighbors like saying, oh my gosh, you, you're just like you know this baby machine and all this sort of stuff. And she said, but I don't have to go to work. My husband does, is the breadwinner of the family. In your family, you have to work too. And your husband is not doing much as far as with helping with the kids. In, they're looking at their rural neighbors, right? And there's, there's not a lot of John Lennon type, like, oh, I'll take care of it, you know, kind of thing. It's much more, less balanced. And outside women are really having to do a lot of, not just running the home and having a responsibility for dinner on the table, but also drawing an income of some kind, too. So they see themselves as being, there's having less pressure on them. Now, gender roles are fairly clear, right? Within the house, that's the woman's domain. Outside the house, that's typically the man's domain. But let's say you have a family where, I know this one family of 10 kids, five girls and five boys. It's a really interesting sort of symmetry. Those girls know a lot about farm work. And those boys, because they were the six through 10, they know how to cook really well <laughs> because their sisters were already doing all the chores for a long time. So, you know, but it's everybody works hard. And it's not like, you know, 
dad or father or whatever, you know, husband like sitting in a chair and like saying, you know, I'm just going to watch the Packers game or something and you guys make me dinner and stuff like that. No, everybody's working hard. But it's, 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 they're clear gender roles. There's no question about that. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. And then you mentioned you. this earlier on, the self-paid medical thing. Now, when I go to a doctor, I might have a lab test that says $200 mm -hmm. comes in the bill. And it goes to my insurance company and they negotiate down to $40. I have to pay $10 copay. Is yep. there any recognition, is there any help for, I mean, catastrophic thing, is there any way the medical system can help them get away from that, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me give it, I'm going to reveal something that the, that the big networks are not going to like me to say. So those advertised prices are complete fiction. That's what's known as charge master rates. So for example, I just give a very, very kind of clear apple to apple thing. An ace bandage, three inch ace bandage, it's advertised on most healthcare networks as $30. They don't expect to get $30. They're paying somewhere probably like 75 to 80 cents for that. On an Amazon, you can buy it for like five or something. That's all the markup. Your typical in large insurer, like Quartz, Humana, that kind of thing, is getting a 75% discount. So they're paying 25%, somewhere around there. If you're on Medicare, Medicaid, it's about an 80 to 85% discount. Now that 20 to 15% or whatever that they're actually paying, the healthcare networks are not losing. They're not making as much money, but they're not losing because the people that calculate the, what, what Medicare and Medicaid is going to pay are smart people. They know what the costs are. They know that they buy things in bulk and that sort of thing. You will never get a straight answer from executives about saying, oh, we're losing money. We're going to have to shut our doors and that sort of thing. So the thing with self-pay patients like the Amish is that they're starting with those $30 ace bandages. And they don't have the lobbying power that, say, Quartz or Humana or the government has, but that sort of thing. Now, what we, and I'm, this is part of my volunteer work on healthcare, is that for healthcare networks that have a very large plain population in their service area, and they say, we want people to come here, we want their business, because they will pay their bills. They know that Amish are good for paying their bills. They say, and it's basically, they do have a sort of bulk you know, advantage there, right? They have sort of a collective strength that way. And so they will negotiate rates that they, they would say is close to what's called MA rates, medical assistance rates, so Medicare and Medicaid rates as possible. Um, for catastrophic expenses, which is defined by most networks as $250,000 or more, they'll negotiate, right? The, the, but it really depends. Mayo is terrible. Mayo is an awful, I mean, it's wonderful care, but terrible as far as like negotiating with plain people. Gunderson and La Crosse, fantastic. But Gunderson is a secondary facility. It's not a tertiary facility. So if you need, say, a transplant or something, well, you have to go to Mayo. You have to go to UW. You have to go to uh, Freighter in Milwaukee. It's a very, very challenging thing. This is probably the biggest economic stressor among the Amish today is health care costs. Yeah. Anybody ever been to, like, Tijuana, Mexico, oh, yeah. over the border? You cross the border. And you see clinics and pharmacies and that sort of thing, and tons and tons of North Americans or U.S. Americans typically there. Always the Amish people down there too, because it's cheaper. For cash pay patients, it's much cheaper. And the quality of the care is actually quite good, because they're typically all U.S. trained. Mexican culture is considered more sort of patient friendly in many ways. The providers, the physicians tend to be, have better bedside manner than some of their U.S. counterparts. And so it's what's called medical tourism, that not just you know, Amish, but a lot of Amish go on the train, they're going to Tijuana. Why Tijuana? Healthcare. That kind of thing. Gonna get my hernia repaired down there. You know? Yes? Why the aversion to photography? Great question. So the aversion to photography. It's basically a little in, literal interpretation. I never remember which number commandment it is. Thou shalt not make a graven image. So it's basically the idea that, I mean, traditional Jews and Muslims also have this basic thing of like, not having human representations. And then during the Reformation, you go into old churches and you see like the, the, the faces on statues chisel, chiseled off and that sort of thing. So it's basically an old, very old Judeo-Christian aversion to doing something that would be considered a graven image. Now, the earliest Amish that came to North America came in the 1700s. The vast majority are descended from them. There was a small group that came in the 19th century 
directly from, from Switzerland and, and southeastern Germany, western Germany. And they, at that time, photography became a thing in the 19th century. And many of those early Amish actually had no problem with photography. They didn't see it as being, they, they didn't have the same sort of interpretation. So you'll find, like in books about the history of the Amish, photographs of Amish people from the 19th century. And they are those Europeans that came over at that time. Nowadays, the way that they look at it is they say, well, look, our kids are cute and we know the tourists want to take our picture and that sort of thing. They'll say, as long as we don't pose for it, whatever. You know, they don't like it in the same way that I don't, I wouldn't like it if I went out in my, you know, pajamas or something to get my newspaper in the morning and to have five people think that I'm really charming looking and taking my picture. <laughs> think about it, yeah. right? Suppose somebody was camped out in front of your house and it's a beautiful morning and you come out in your robe to get the newspaper and somebody's taking your picture. Or taking your picture anywhere, like going through the supermarket. It's like, oh, how cute. Taking a picture, you know. <laughs> so that's kind of where they are at today. It's just like, it's sort of an intrusion that we just would prefer not to deal with. We just, and the perfect way to actually work on that now is when we opened, and when we were in the shop there, Yeah, I mean, some, some will allow it. For um, documentation of medical cases, they'll allow that um, because that's an important part of a medical record. Some that do a lot of cross-border travel will allow it for ID purposes. And they'll often say, boy, the picture doesn't look very good. I don't feel like I'm, you know, this is like I'm doing anything wrong because that picture really doesn't look very nice, but whatever, for those kind of purposes. A small handful of older Amish want to travel back to Europe and they'll need passports to do that. That you can't use, you can't, you have to have a passport to travel internationally. So, so some will do that. Mirrors? They, very few, they do have mirrors, but they have very, very few. Part of the whole, you know, sort of aversion to photography is that if you're posing for photographs, that you, it you could be somewhat narcissistic. It could lead to narcissism. Mm -hmm. That's why women don't wear makeup or jewelry, or men don't wear jewelry for that matter either. Mm -hmm. Women don't get their hair colored, right? They don't have their hair cut typically. So it's just sort of like it's not about what you look like and typically the face is the most important source of what's considered beauty, but it's what you are here. That's why, for example, traditional Amish dolls have no faces on them. It's an expression of humility. It's like to remind kids it's about what's here, not what's here. All right, well, I th uh, maybe one more question and we, I think we probably need to wrap up. So. <laughs> Amish, many love Amish, so, uh, many Amish love using solar power. A lot of it is because um, it's this, the, the lack of electricity is not lack of power, it's not being connected to the grid. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a symbolic thing of not being dependent in that way. Now, yes, they're getting fuel from outside sources and that sort of thing, but there's a symbolism about being connected to the power grid that they prefer to avoid. Solar is great. They use batteries for all kinds of purposes, including powering the flashers on their buggies and that sort of thing. And their cell phones, and, and their cell phones exactly. And so, um, you know, solar, you, you, they're, they're not like running appliances with that, but they are charging batteries, and right? And, and some, an Amish home with solar lights. yeah, that's very rare. It's typically more, you know, kerosene lanterns and other lights that are sort of bright that way. But typically lighting is not a choice they would make for that. Um, a lot of, um, youth, especially boys, have those little LED lanterns right on their head, because those are great. I mean, just, you can really see well. Every Amish person has a lot of flashlights. The way I like to describe, what's it like to stay in an Amish home? It's like camping, except you're inside of a house. <laughs> right? That really is what it's like. It's like, you know, you know, it's like, oh, is this where the door is to the bathroom, that kind of thing? And you just kind of know, it's like, okay, this is where the toilet is, where I flush, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, it's, it's like camping, <laughs> except you're in the house. So. All right, thank you very much for coming this evening. I really appreciate it.